This is In Hindsight, Half a Century of Research Discoveries in Canadian History, presented by Dr. Donald B. Smith and produced by the Ontario Historical Society. great pleasure to speak today about a close friend, Gary Potts. Episode 19 is about, about Gary and the larger issue about Tamagami, about the Tamagamaga Anishinaabe, or the Tamagami people. Gary was an extraordinary individual. He passed away three years ago, and I had the good fortune to know him quite well. He was chief of the Tamagami Anishinaabe for an, many years and was the leader in the in the moment when they began the important land claim in the early 1970s. And Gary and I intersected. It was the historian entering a different world because, listen, I'm an historical researcher and anybody thinking this is going to be full of profundities about Aboriginal or Indigenous law. Well, I'm afraid not. It's not my field. And it is uber complex. I, I must say, I've got the greatest admiration for those that do it. And um, it's it's just, I'm, it's, I'm going to be touching on it, but please be cautious. Buyer beware. I'll give you my spin and it has no legal validity, but this is about a land claim. So I've got to say something. Okay, let's begin. Now, we're going to fit right in with episode 18. We looked at Lester Pearson, a very admirable individual, an excellent um, prime minister in so many ways, um, but had, like his generation, uh, a blind spot. That was Indigenous rights. Um, it, it just, but he, he, he was a good person. He, 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 what, one of the positives uh, that we reviewed last week was that he endorsed and put forward the Hawthorne Report, which is a very in-depth in study of in First Nations in Canada in the mid-1960s. And that was, it. the two volumes were delivered in the last year of uh, Pearson's administration. And so, the, for the, and he, he said, he got the lesson of the, the report was that, um, the First Nations should be allowed special status, that is, uh, to quote volume one of the report, they should be, uh, there should be an attempt to achieve social and economic equality between, quote, Indians and white. And Pearson promised that the Indian Act would be revised, but after prior consultation with the First Nations. Okay, that's the link with our last episode. Well, unfortunately, the new administration, the Trudeau administration, disregarded the Hawthorne Report's recommendation of special status and instead introduced the old policy, the old approach, which was now called integration, but the old name certainly applies as well, assimilation. It's just assimilation with a new name. And that is what the white paper was about. The white paper was a policy proposal to eliminate the Indian Department, to eliminate uh, the Indian Act, to eliminate reserves and turn everything over to the provinces and turn the reserves into the administration on the reserves into municipal governments. This was a total reversal. Now, in fairness, I must point out that Trudeau later did a complete U-turn on this. And we he was instrumental in, in having Aboriginal rights. Uh, certainly went along with it. It recognized in the Constitution of 1982. But at this stage, it's a totally different approach. He's green as a cucumber on these issues, in my opinion. And uh, it's it's just a mess. As <laughs> Well, what happens in my book, Seen But Not Seen, this is the opening of the book. So I have a, I'm, I'm taking something for granted here. Uh, so let's just do a little backup. The white paper, which is a policy proposal, was introduced in 1969, and the response was total. Well, all, there was some some support, very tiny a bit, but overall a negative. This was just terrible. First Nations reacted to this terribly. They didn't were in, in love with the Indian Act or anything, but at least 
the Indian Act gave them uh, some constitutional recognition as being different. Now, if you strike that out, that's gone. And also their dream, of course, was to stay, not to disappear. They're the original peoples. So there was a great opposition. The white paper on Indian policy was bitterly opposed. Now, again, I'm trying to be fair in all of this. And honestly, I must point out as well, but once we're getting close to the present, within 40, 50 years, I'm telling you, it's not my, that's not my expertise. A historian needs to have some perspective, some time gap, some access to sources, and it's just not instant response to events. That's not what we do. So, but that's what I'm doing today. So fasten your seatbelts. Okay. Now, in fairness to uh, Pierre Trudeau and, and his administration, his Minister of Indian Affairs was Jean Chrétien, in, in fairness to them, this was regarded by the dominant society as a progressive policy. In Saskatchewan, the do- goals of the CCF, later to become the NDP, under Tommy Douglas, celebrated humanitarian and the great Saskatchewan premier, his goals as premier and those of his predecessor, Premier Woodrow Lloyd from 1944 to 1964, were virtually identical to those of the white paper of 1969. So if you take the context of the day, that Trudeau and his team are really quite in tune with the dominant society's philosophy, but they were not in tune with what the feelings in Indian country were. The strong resistance actually parallels, in my mind, to the response in Quebec to Lord Durham's proposal that the French Canadians should be assimilated in his famous report in 1939. Uh, Historians were always looking for parallels, never exactly the same, but there's, there's one that does, in my mind, hit home. It's the same reaction the French Canadians had when they were told that they should assimilate into the dominant English speaking society in. This was in 1939, in 1839, and of course it was, it was soundly defeated. The French Canadians, a century earlier, had rejected the argument that their progress demanded the elimination of their culture, and the First Nations in the 1969 period on were exactly the same. Immediately, young, educated First Nations leaders joined ranks with Indigenous elders to oppose the government's position paper, recommending their eventual assimilation. Now, history is all about change, and our perspectives change as, well, developments, new developments occur, new, new attitudes come forth, and this certainly is the case in the early 1970s, and the big story there, and this again is not one to be done in depth today, just to be suggested, it's the legal developments. Assisting the Indigenous activists in their cause in the early 1970s was the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in what is called the Nishka case. It's an important case in northwestern British Columbia. Uh, the Nishka won a, the, their land case or their, their, their entitlement case on a technicality in 1973. Six of the seven judges in the Supreme Court recognized for the first time in Canadian history the existence of, quote, Aboriginal title to land. This is unbelievable. This is a a turning point. It's, It's absolutely monumental, 1973, because of the Nishka case. Well, this is the context in which a young graduate student in Canadian history at the University of Toronto, now I enter, was introduced to the topic of Indigenous land rights. And believe you me, I was still on a learning curve. Well, how do I come into this? Well, happenstance. Absolutely, my whole career is happenstance. Opportunities arise and, and, and some turn out to be quite productive. And this was one. Throughout the nineteen, the early 1970s, I kept up my interest in Grey Owl. Remember back, episode three? And I kept it going as a side interest to my Mississauga work. My real specialty was 19th century Mississauga history. But there are many parallels. The Mississauga are Anishinaabe, the same as the folks in, in Lake Tomaga, in the Lake, Lake Tomogamy district. So there were, there were parallels, no doubt. And anyways, but I kept it going. And I made several trips to Tomogamy in the early 70s. 
and met old timers who still remembered Grail from his years there before World War I and then a return visit in 1925. Lake Tamagami, and by the way, is one of the most beautiful bodies of water in North America. It contains more than 120 islands and has a shoreline of a thousand kilometers. It's about 100 miles northwest of North Bay. Near the geographical center of the lake is where the First Nations are today and the Tamagama Anishinaabeg, the deep water people. That's where they live. So I visited, of course, Bear Island and I visited, um, well, to the town of Tamagami in the uh, North Bay and met some folks in the early 1970s. Just sort of a break from my PhD thesis, which was on the Mississauga and centered really around Peter Jones. Back to episode five. Okay. One friend, a um, woman who became a very close friend, was Agnes Bellany Lalonde. That was Grail's daughter. She then resided in the village of Tomogamy on the mainland. Sometimes uh, she relocated uh, to uh, North Bay shortly after and had a rooming house. And I stayed there a couple of times. Um, I always tried to visit her. Um, years later, her son Albert, Albert Lalonde, after his mother's death, gave me the original copy of my first letter to her, sent from Toronto, June 2nd, 1971. And so I just including this, this is research discoveries, and so let's let's, let's go the full full hog here. So here I'm quoting myself, my letter to Agnes, and it just it, it just gives you the spirit of it. This is June 1971. I'm gonna meet Gary shortly after. So you, I want you to know the, the momentum here. And keep in mind. History is contextual. We have to understand the context before we can understand, really, we'll never fully understand anything, but to, to get the, uh, an honest, um, make an honest attempt at it, we have to know the context. So here's, here's this young guy who's 25 years old writing to Agnes and telling her, my research is coming along very well. I promise next time to bring some very good photos with me. So I I would go up to Tomogamy and it's sort of a break. It was a way different topic and uh, I enjoyed myself immensely. I concluded that letter thanking her husband and herself for, quote, their very warm welcome on my last visit to Tomogamy. Well, so I'm I'm getting programmed on this very nicely. Then in March 1973, I first met Gary Potts. Gary was the newly elected chief of the... Tamagama Anishinaabeg, and I met him at a conference at Trent University. It was on collecting, sifting, writing the history of Tamagami country. I got the exact date, March 3rd, 1973. That's one of the few positives of being a pack rat. You have an enormous amount of material. But at this stage, I didn't really, I wasn't a collector so much then because I was like I'm living in a rooming house in Toronto and doing my PhD thesis and I couldn't keep everything. I couldn't keep hardly anything. But later I would, and I started to keep diaries too in the 1980s. So I become quite formidable as a pack rat. At this stage, I'm just amateur night. Well, I met Gary, and I promised to get in touch if I came across any interesting historical references to, to tomogamy in my Grail work. I wanted to uh, find out what it was like on, on the Lake Tomogamy area in the early 20th century, because that's when Grail had arrived there. So I visited, um, well, I did my PhD work on the Mississauga, but then take a break at the National Archives in Ottawa, now the Library and Archives, Arch now Library and Archives Canada. I take a break and do some Tomogamy work. And there I found very important 1907 petition, a petition to Ottawa signed by 50 community members, which is enormous. 50 community members, that's about half the community, called in the petition for a reserve. Bluntly, Alec Paul, the second chief, who knew English, and Frank White Bear, head chief, wrote on 23rd of February, 1907, quote, we have been asking for a reserve on Lake Tomogamy for years. We do not know of any band but ourselves who have not their own reserves. We have no land that we can settle on. End of quote. The Tomogamy Anishinaabeg had not participated in the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850, south of their hunting grounds. The treaty that was made with the First Nations communities from Lake Nipissing and northern shore of Lake Huron. They had not been 
they had not been partners. They not they weren't there. The assumption was they had been. They weren't. And so the case then becomes to get flesh out the historical side, as well as other issues, mind you, but one that I'm, of course, interested in is the historical side. That's where I can contribute. So I'm all, all ready to help as I can, as much as I could. And I already was into this because when in your PhD program, you have to prepare in several fields. And uh, one, I had a reading course at uh, the Royal Ontario Museum in uh, really indigenous uh, topics. And in 1972, I had, had, I had a reading course with Ed Rogers at the Royal Ontario Museum. It was uh, all approved by the Department of History and everything was fine. But it was when doing that report, and I can tell you, I can date it because I would have done that um, 1971, probably, uh, perhaps early 73, but I'm pretty sure it's 72. I did a paper for Ed on the visit of Frank Speck, American anthropologist, he was then in his about early 40s. He visited the Tomogamy. He spoke with the Anishinaabeg and did quite an investive search, research job there. Um, actually, the reason that we know he was so, they were, the group was so open to him was they thought he was a, he was a government official. He was employed, he was an American anthropologist employed for a, a term contract by the uh, Canadian government. Uh, so they, they knew he was with the Canadian government. They thought he was here to resolve the land claim. So boy, they gave him everything they could. They did everything they possibly could to convince him that really this is... <laughs> We need a reserve. I mean, we're not, this is ridiculous. And so the key spokesperson was Alec Paul because he spoke English. That's the key in a lot of this. And he was a respected elder, a respected member of the community. And so he really spoke, uh, spec. He's the one, the filter for spec. So we've got quite a bit of testimony by Alex Paul. I'd like to share some with you. Now, Frank Speck was a very, he was a fun guy. He, he really, he, 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 he didn't like theory. Well, I'm sorry, I got to come clean. I'm not so keen on it either. Uh, but Frank loved, he just loved stories and getting in there and getting all this, these accounts and things and coming through with a good narrative. Well, anyways, Frank uh, recorded Alec Paul in great depth. And he was from the University of Pennsylvania. That was his regular appointment. When he went back to Philadelphia, he had, was interviewed by the press, by a, a particularly one of the papers, and he told them exactly what he found. He was astounded by what Alec Paul told him, and I want to share that with you. And it will be a, it's, a, it's a quote, so here's my reading skills uh, now and, and, and tests. Here it is from the paper, late 1913, the Philadelphia newspaper. He described the whole question of hunting rights, their outlook and all. And here's what Alec told him. My grandfather's land was divided among two sons, my father and Pashabo, my uncle. We were to own this land as no other family, no other Indians could hunt on it. Each family had its own dis district where it belonged and owned the game. That was such for extra to provide for extra stock for food and clothes. If another Indian hunted on our territory, we could shoot him. This division of land started in the beginning of time and always remained and always remained. An owner could give permission for someone to hunt in his territory, but they must do so. Strangers must ask. Now, I'm put on my glasses, you'll be glad to know, so I won't stumble again. <laughs> Here we go. Glasses in place. Continuing on, Alex added, when the white people came, they commenced killing all the game. They left nothing on purpose to breed. I remember about 20 years ago, some Nipissing Indians came north to hunt on my father's land. He told them not to hunt the beaver. Quote, this is our land. You can fish but you must not touch the fur, as that is all we have to live on. Sometimes an owner would give permission for strangers to hunt for a certain time or on a certain track. This was often done for friends or when neighbors had had a poor season. Later, the favor might be returned. So in short, uh, what Alec Paul is explaining to Frank Speck is the etiquette, the protocol. 
how they managed the land. And this is very, very important. They weren't nomads casually crossing over. This was their, it was like a farm. That's almost exactly what Alec Paul is saying. And Speck had never heard this. I mean, he knew the concept and all, but this was such an eloquent presentation of it. And he shared this with the Philadelphia newspaper reporter. Just to continue, and we'll wrap it up with this final section of the testimony. When the white people came, they commenced killing all the game. They left nothing on purpose to breed and keep up the supply, because the white men don't care about the animals. They are after the money. After the white man kills all the game in one place, he can take a train and go 300 miles or more to another and do the same there. But the Indian cannot do that. He must stay on his own section all the time and support his family on what it produces. So he has to preserve his game stock and live what is bred on the increase. What a remarkable text. Thank you, Frank Speck. Thank you, Alec Paul. And that helps me as well, or certainly did at those days when I was just beginning, because it, it's so similar to what Grail learned from the Espanol family in Biscotese. It's it's an Indian, it's a First Nations idea of the environment, of how, how it works, the recess, reciprocity between the uh, between animals and humans. It's it's just there's so much there, and so much of the care involved and the concern. Well, I greatly enjoyed my paper on Frank Speck, and I kept it all these years. Wow, that was lucky, because I was able to quote it for you. Now, just moving on, we'll now proceed to more information from the National Archives, now the Library and Archives Canada, more information from RG10. Those are the Indian Affair record, Indian Affairs records. And I wanted to share this with you because I wanted to just tell you what it was like in the old days. Boy, this is a, almost half a century ago. Almost half a century ago, there was not the interest. In, and I'm telling you, Indian claims were, I mean, it was almost impossible. It wasn't for pre-Confederation claims. It was just not done. Uh, so it's now, I'm doing my work on the Mississauga, and now a little poking around with the Tomogamy situation. And I'm telling you, I was looking at original files. I mean, paper files, original papers, <laughs> original paper files. You couldn't get within, well, what should I say, 10 miles of these today. They're so precious. But that's the way it was. It was very casually uh, looked after. And um, well, anyway, so there's one file that was really good on tomography issues. And uh, well, I certainly told Gary about it. And uh, I'm not claiming any great, great credit there, but it was it was pretty obvious and I passed that on to him. Now, uh, things do improve too. And I want to put a positive in here for Government of Canada, because what they did shortly afterwards was they began a massive microfilming project. So all this material was open, but not the originals. No, thank you. No, microfilm copies. And uh, that's now in the digital age, that's even going even further. I mean, my heavens, microfilm was my revolution, but today it's digital, putting stuff on the web. Now, back to reality. As my rain, main responsibility in the early 1970s was to complete my PhD thesis, I had to leave the quotation marks, heavy lifting, on the tomogamy issue to others. Happily, Mogami Anishinaabeg hired in uh, shortly afterwards my good friend Jim Morrison, one of Canada's most skilled Indigenous claims researchers, and well, I was, uh, I, I I I just couldn't do it, and also I wasn't uh, unable to do it because I wouldn't be physically there. I was going, I was taking up a position. Now back to Gary. Two wonderful letters from Gary, and to my great joy, I found these just last week. On receiving the materials from me, Gary sent me a thank you note for items received on, uh, he sent the letter June the 11th, 1973. So uh, here it quote, I now thank you very much for all the material you've sent me, end of quote. And uh, so Gary, and please, I hope you, uh, I'll sp speak, sing, speak now like the old, the old war veteran, I hope you young people will learn cursive writing, because otherwise you would not be able to read Gary's letter. It's it's written in by hand. By the time of Gary's next letter, dated Bear Island, 25th of April, 1970, 
1954, great progress had been made with the case. Now, this is really interesting. Here's what Gary wrote in April 1974. Quote, I still feel that this land claim case has the potential depth to set a precedent with regards to native rights in the land. End of quote. My goodness. Yeah. That's that just takes my breath away to read that now, and and that, but then it goes on and this is Gary this is Gary to a T, he ended his handwritten note in this wonderful fashion quote, I'll be looking forward to the time when you can come to Bear Island and we'll be most likely seeing you in Toronto before you go out west. End of quote, Gary knew that I'd recently received a job offer from the Department of History at the University of Calgary. That letter was the last I'd received from Gary while still an Ontario resident. I was on my way west and came to Calgary in early August 1974. Well, from distant Alberta and the demands of a full-time teaching job, being fresh at it, I could no longer assist. Although I did briefly appear as an expert witness for the Tomogamy, Tomogamy people for two days in late February 1983. Uh, that was in the Bear Island court case, which was held in Toronto, uh, 1983. So some, almost 10 years later. And that is, it's a very, very minor part. Just a walk and roll. Just very, very minor. Jim Morrison did the heavy lifting and others uh, in, in, in the behind the Tomogamy people. Now, we'll fast forward because I'm sort of out a bit. I'm not so much in this picture anymore, um, but I did come back for the, the case. Uh, two days, I think it was. And um, the trial began in spring 1982 before Aboriginal land and treaty rights had become law under the Canada, Canada's Constitution of 1982, that same year. So the case begins, it's, it's before this recognition of Indian and treaty rights comes into full effect. And so it's, the timing is terrible, unfortunately. But that's the way it was. The, cart, the case began, and it's extraordinary, this case. It begins then in spring 1982, and it goes for, believe it or not, two years. This is the longest court case in the history of Ontario to that date. Over 3,000 exhibits were presented as evidence to the court. And the proceedings themselves fill 68 volumes. Extraordinary. <laughs> well, that was only the beginning because the battle would be waged at a new level because to the great disappointment of certainly the people themselves, the Tamagami Anishinaabeg and others as well, certainly myself, the judge, the case was denied. How did this court case begin? Gary Potts' entry into the office of Bruce Clark, a lawyer, a lawyer in Haleberry, a town to the north east, uh, northeast of Lake Tomogamy, his visit to a lawyer in Haleberry in 1973 had begun the Tomogamy land claims fight. They put together an imaginative strategy they filed cautions on 110 townships in the Tomogamy region in the area they knew as Nadaka Menan, that is the Anishinaabegs of Lake Tomogamy's ancestral territory. So this land was placed under a development freeze. This was unbelievably unexpected, and but the judge accepted it and the caution was applied. This prevented or inhibited economic development. The Anishinaabeg claimed entitlement to these lands, their ancestral territory. For over a century, Ontario had refused to recognize their title and rights to their traditional lands. And this, this was their entry. This was their wedge into it. A caution was placed on the land. And that's how the court case comes about. Now, a little bit of legal stuff. And here, my apologies. And I toss, the, toss this issue to those that are qualified. But I'll give you just a brief introduction to it. One of the biggest stumbling blocks in all of this, this in Indigenous law, is our Constitution. Ottawa is responsible for Indian affairs, but the provinces control all public land within their boundaries. And this is it. This, it's just the, the caution. There's a move to get this caution removed uh, by the province. Federal government's not 
really uh, intervening at all. So it, it's not, it's the province controls crown lands. So the province intervenes, begins litigation in 1979, and that will result in the court case in 1982, which goes to 1984. And after that, there'll be two appeals, which take it to 1991. Eventually, a court action initiated by the NDP government of Bob Ray in 1993 and completed by Mike Harris and the Conservatives uh, two years, two, two, two or three years later, eventually it lifted the cautions. So that was it. But the court case itself uh, did go on. Uh, well, the, the reversal in 1984, is, is that, that's to be appealed. And so that's exactly what happens next. Meanwhile, the historical side of the tomogamy story and other legal aspects and everything actually being uh, put together for the appeal. There'll be two appeals. Eventually, the case will reach the, reach the Supreme Court of Canada. Gradually, the tomogamy and it's not being fleshed out the full story. And uh, it really is a story of uh, the to Lake Tomogamy people have been left aside. They're not part of this treaty. And uh, there's an onslaught of outsiders in the at the turn of the century, prospectors, trappers, tourists re reaching Lake Tomogamy, particularly after the Ontario government uh, builds a railway up, up north uh, towards James Bay. That's uh, the, at the turn of the century. It brings in all kinds of people. And the Ontario government in 1901 creates a huge forest reserve to protect the time, pine timber. But throughout all this, the Ontario government is making no attempt to provide the Tomogamy people with, with reserved land. And they go even further. They tell the First Nations that they could not cut timber for any purpose. Even before cutting firewood, they must obtain the fire ranger, ranger's permission. Once again, Chief Alec Paul in 1917 requested a reserve, and it's very short and it's very eloquent. Paul wrote, we think that we deserve something in our reserve. We have been here before any government was born in Canada. So we're still at a situation, stalled situation, and that's why Gary Potts takes the lead, begins, gets the caution applied to the land, the land case begins, and things get to be serious. So a, a, just a tremendous, tremendous contribution by Gary. And it would go on for years. Well, the court case, the 1984 decision is appealed twice, eventually reaches the Supreme Court of Canada. And unfortunately, despite all this work, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the lower court's judgments. And the reason being, they followed Ontario's position and the case was a bitter defeat. It was held that the Tomogamy people had forfeited treaty rights because they'd ad apparently adhered to the 1850 Robinson-Huron Treaty. So the idea is that they began to get treaty annuities, that is payments, uh, a number of years later. They hadn't they recognized they not signed the treaty, but they got these uh, annuities or, or payments. And this, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the lower courts in stating the reason being why they could not uh, be recognized as having Aboriginal rights. What was it? what was this? This is incredible, and I I do I do I throw the ball to scholar uh, legal scholars on this who can take this right to the end or come close to get reaching the end. This is a, a terribly um, strange decision because the Supreme Court of Canada is making enormous number of decisions at this point which are favorable to um, native land rights. It, it's it's just um, instead this this position taken is so hard line it's incredible and and essentially my reading is that what they're saying is the first nations have occupancy rights but not ownership that's that seems to me but don't again i'm an amateur in this legal stuff so that's it and uh, 1991 that's it spring court kind of turns it down so the legal road is ended um, gary keeps on uh, the, the, really with Ontario, there was good discussions in the early 90s of a, a treaty of coexistence between Ontario and the deep water people for joint management of the land. Um, and that was very hopeful. But uh, 
it just it didn't it didn't pan out and the the story at this point on is is really quite complex and it's contemporary history and i'm I'm just simply not qualified to even express an opinion except it's very very disappointing for Gary who had given so so much well Gary uh, after this is involved in the fight against the taking down the the taking of the old growth timber the logging and the fight's a good fight there um he he was influential with the Assembly of First Nations, particularly in the 1980s. He had a, he was a well-respected individual and a very, very a good friend. I had the good fortune of seeing him two or three times after. Well, three or four, maybe even half a dozen, because just uh, at conferences or, or um, uh, two or three visits to Tomogamy, um, we kept in touch. And what, what a blow it was when he passed away in 2020 on Bear Island. Incredible individual. Next week, in the final episode, episode 20, I have the great privilege of talking about another friend, Olive Dickinson, one of Canada's most distinguished historians of Indigenous Canada. And I'm looking forward to that with great pleasure.